Today's scripture reading is from um, 1 John 2, 7 through 11. That's uh, page 1899 in your pew Bibles. Um, I'm Cameron. I help lead the youth group here uh, and hear the word of God. Dear friends, I am not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have since beginning. This old command, this old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. It is truth, its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your gift to us of your presence. Now we ask that you would come and lead us as we seek to understand uh, your word. Would you reveal to us the truth that it would not return void, Lord, but find a good place to plant in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're in a series out of the book of 1 John, uh, which we're calling uh, Deep Living or Living Deep. And, and the hope is to challenge people to take their walk to the next level. Um, I got the idea from this from Brian Wilkerson, who's a pastor in the Midwest who I often listen to, and uh, he, he did a series very similar to this, and I changed some of it and added things and took things out so it would fit our church, but I'm really blessed to be able to talk about living deep. And today I want to talk about deep connections, deep connections. Um, the pictures that you see on the, on the board are from my recent scuba diving trip to Maui. And uh, that's not me, but that, that was taken by our instructor, uh, one of the people in, in the team, and uh, uh, in a place called the Cathedrals, which is about 80 feet down. And uh, if you've been here for several weeks, I actually showed pictures of some of what it was like to be down there and some of the, the amazing marine life that we saw. But uh, the reality is that it's a series of caves and, and arches that you swim through. And, it's, it's an amazing place to go because there are moments as you swim through these tunnels where it is pitch black. You run into the fins of the person in front of you, and the person behind you bangs it, and you hit the wall, and you can see nothing. If, there, if there's not an underwater light on, a flashlight on, you can't tell where you're going. And, uh, and yet then you come out into these places where, like on the screen, the sun streams down, and, and there's something amazing about seeing that ahead and wanting to get to that place of the light where you can see some things and then you can look up and you can see the, the s sun shining on the waves uh, 80 feet above you. It's, it's a very magical, wonderful, awesome, miraculous uh, place. Uh, and it's a great metaphor for going deeper in our lives. The passage that we're using to kind of set the tone is out of the message version. It's out of 1 John 2, 24. Stay with what you heard from the beginning, the original message. Let it sink into your life. If what you heard from the beginning lives deeply in you, you will live deeply in both the Son and the Father. That's the hope that John has as he writes this letter to us. That's the hope that I have as I stand before you and, and teach what 1 John is about. We ended last week on this lovely, easy thing to do. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. You're all doing that, right? You've all got it figured out. You're just like Jesus. I have to tell you, when I read this, I feel overwhelmed. It's like it's never going to be possible, Lord. There, there are so many things that are in my life that aren't the way you were, and there's so many ways that I act that aren't the way you wanted. But, but it's interesting. The Holy Spirit through John, you remember John is that young disciple who now is an old man writing to the church, maybe the last living apostle, and he's writing. What he says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Why would he tell us that 
if it weren't possible. Interesting thought. It doesn't feel possible to me, but why would he ask that of us if it was an impossibility? There must be some truth in here that we're supposed to to get. Um, In 1 John, John asked three questions. I went over them a couple of weeks ago. I want to mention them again. The first one is an experiential, experiential question about the depth of your faith. How are you really living? How do you really live? And, and the answer out of 1 John is to go deep. You need to seek more obedience and more holiness. And that's what we talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, the truth is that John speaks in a Hebrew way and he, he gives two extremes a lot of places. He talks about darkness and light. He talks about love and hate. Um, he talks about truth and lies. He talks about everything in an extreme. That's a very Jewish way of speaking, especially in the first century. Jesus one day is talking to the Pharisees and he says, which is better? He's, he's just healed a man in the, on the Sabbath. And he says, which is better, to heal a man or to kill a man? Well, you and I know there's, there's a, a continuum between those two places. But Jesus is making a point. He's saying, I, I want to use this Hebraism, this way of talking, to make a point. And so the extremes are the point. But, but you and I know there's a continuum between healing a man and killing a man. There's a lot of choices in between. He's just trying to force the Pharisees to see the truth that in not wanting to heal somebody, they are in fact cursing him to death. That's what John is doing in 1 John. And so there's this continuum, if you will, between sin and John specifically says repeated sin, continually being in sin and holiness. And and there are none of us that have made it to the far end of that continuum yet. I know that because I know you. And you know that because you know me. And I also know humanity. None of us are perfectly holy. That's where Jesus was, but we're not there. But the truth is there's a movement along that continuum, and that's really what I want to talk about today. So so what John says is if you want to go deeper in your faith, you need to stop the continual sin, and you need to move toward holiness. There's a second question he asks. What do you really believe? It's the doctrinal question, because what we believe makes a difference. And, And... His answer in 1 John is to grow deeper, grow wiser in truth. Again, he gives us a continuum between lies and truth. And and you and I know that we're we're somewhere on there. Uh, We're somewhere between the place where we believe lies about ourselves and about God and where we believe the truth. That's why we teach the Bible here, is we believe that it reveals truth. And we want you guys to be learning truth so you can set aside lies. I want to ask you, what lies have you believed in your life? Maybe what lies do you still believe? I can give you some that I know are present in this room. Uh, I can give you one that I know is present in this person. Uh, When I was growing up, my my father uh, was a really good man, didn't, didn't, drink, didn't do anything violent, he, 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 didn't, he didn't yell or scream or do any of that, but he worked all the time. And so, so he was a good man that just was never around as far as I was concerned. And guess what? I grew up believing that was true about God, that God the Father was a good God who really didn't care about me. I was kind of on my own. So if, you're, if I'm going to get it done, I better do it. If I'm going to fix the problem, I better fix it. God is good. He's up there somewhere, but he's not here. He's not in my life. And I believed that lie. What's the truth? Jesus says, lo, I am with you always. That at every moment, even when I felt like God wasn't there, Jesus was right here. I just needed to to reach around. And sometimes I think he was reaching around me and shaping my path and my walk without me seeing him or believing him. But that lie was present in me. Some of you have that same lie in your life. Or, Or maybe you believe that God is angry and is always looking for something to punish. That's a lie. Or or maybe you believe that you aren't lovable, that something about you is broken and you'll never really be lovable, or something about you is so bad, some historic event is so troublesome that your whole future is shaped by that and you'll never be free. There are lies that we believe about ourselves, 
I'm not okay. I can't change. I'll always be this way. And there are lies that we believe about God. He doesn't care. He's not with me. He won't act here. He can't meet the need of my life. And, and what John says is, you gotta make a choice. Are you gonna believe the lies? Man, I hear those echoes going way back. Or am I gonna move along the continuum toward the truth? None of us get there. Jesus is the truth. But we're all on a pathway there. I want us to be moving on that continuum toward truth. Um, there's a third question, it's relational, and I wanna spend my time on that today. How do you really love? Well, John says you wanna do a test of how deep your walk is with the Lord, look at how loving you are. You might have great doctrine, and you might be living a really pretty holy life and trying to do all the right things. But what John says, if you don't love, you're a Pharisee. You're holy on the outside, but you're not holy on the inside. And so there's this challenge to go deep and to love more. If you wanna know how to make your walk deeper, I would say the easiest way to begin is to start to love more, more often, more deeply, more people in more difficult places. It's a continuum too. Uh, Jesus is love, God is love, we're told in the scriptures. And, and that's where we're headed and none of us are there, but, but the other end of the, of the continuum is a lack of love. And some of us are so caught up in our own wounds and our own hurts and our own stubbornness that we don't reflect very much of the love of God. Now, some of you are great lovers. I, I am amazed at how loving this congregation is, and I, I just wanna say thank you and, and bless you at how kind uh, you guys are. But I'm telling you, even the kindest has ways that we can get better at loving, and that's what I wanna challenge you, you today. And in fact, I wanna put it together. I wanna do a little geometric ex experiment with you, okay? Uh, X, Y, Z axis. I'm teaching now, I'm not preaching, I'm teaching. Um, those things, continual sin, believing lies, lack of love, they, they pull us toward the darkness. Back into those caves where the light never shines 80 feet down. And if you stay there, pretty soon you suck on your regulator and there's no air. And you die in darkness. But love, and truth and holiness and, and the pursuing those is what John says are the ways we're to go deeper. Pursue these things. Three simple things he wants us to pursue. What he wants us to do is be moving up into the light, not down into the darkness. Again, we're not there yet. But by taking more truth into me, I grow. By taking more love into me and then spreading it around, I grow by trying to live my life in a more holy and obedient way, I grow, I move toward the light. That's what John is saying. Are you in the darkness or are you in the light? He's doing it in a Hebrew way as if it's an extreme, but we all know it's a continuum. He wants us to be moving toward the light, moving toward the surface, getting out of the darkness. This is what it says in 1 John 7 in our text today. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Well, he, it's interesting. He doesn't tell us in this verse what the command is. He says, I'm not writing you something new. You see, in that time, there was a lot of heresy. It's called the Gnostic heresies. And the secret was people would say, oh, you can believe in Jesus, but we have a new truth too. We have a secret truth message. And if you come join our group, our cult, you can have Christianity, but then we'll teach you the secret, the new truth, the new way. And that was springing up all over the Roman and Greek empire, this sense of Gnosticism where you pick and choose and you create some, some kind of polygram of all sorts of religions and just to an amorphous mess. Uh, and John is speaking against that. He says, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you've heard. What he said is, you don't need new truth. You don't need to go try to find what little cult, what little church down the street is teaching new. I'm writing you 
an old command. Well, what's the old command? Well, a few verses later, he tells us, for this is the message you heard from the beginning, we should love one another. We know we have passed from death to life because we love each other. What he really says is the the core of Christianity, the truth of Christianity is not new. You don't have to go hunt for it. There's no secret truth. I'm not going to give you a little trick that if you do this, you'll go deeper. I'm going to tell you the same thing that Christians have been told since the beginning. Beloved, love each other. It comes from our Lord who says this, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What what John says is, I remember. I I was just a teenager, and I remember Jesus calling us all around him and telling us. And he told us not once, but over and over again, love each other, love each other. Love each other. You want to make a difference? Love each other. Love each other. Love each other. You want to change the world? Love each other. Love each other. Love each other. Jesus over and over had this message. God is love, and I want you to be like God. So love each other. Isn't it amazing that the core of Christianity for Jesus was not get your doctrine perfect? Nor was it live a perfect life. He was hanging out with people who were far from living a perfect life. And their doctrine was miserable. Some of them were pagans, and and they were sacrificing to other gods. But he's hanging out with them. Why? Because there's a preeminent part of Christianity. Love one another. And he had to go to them to show them love. Love one another. It's interesting. John says, I'm not writing you a new command. It's the same one you've had. And then he messes me up. Because in verse 8, he says the opposite. Yet I am writing you a new command. Make up your mind, John. You told me it's not a new command. But a verse later, a sentence later, you say, no, it's a new command. I'm confused. There must be something here that I need to get. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. He says, I'm writing you something new, not because it's a different thing, it's still love one another, but the true light is already shining. We're not waiting in the dark for the light to come someday. No, it's already in us. That's what it says here. The truth is seen in him and in you, in us. What happens is through the Holy Spirit, God has put his light in us. It's already started, and every day it's new because every day's a new chance to show the light of Jesus. It's, it's the same command, and it's a new command. Today, right now, reflect the light that already began. It's already started. It's dawning more and more every day. You're not waiting for a Messiah to come and bring light. You have light. You are in light. Sorry, I'm yelling. Chill, Brad. I love this. I love this because it's the truth. The light of God is already in us. You know why this is really important? Because otherwise you're going to hear John's message as legalism. Okay, I now got to go be more holy. I'm going to stop sinning. I will go home and I will work really hard at it. I'll write my list of sins and I will not do them ever again. Or, or, or you're going to take knowledge and you're going to say, okay, I'm going I'm to study the Bible. I'm going to read every book from Genesis to maps, and I'm going to memorize it all. I'm going to get it all down, and, and then I'll be holy. Then I'll be what I'm supposed to. Or, or I'm going to go love. You will be amazed at what a good lover I'm going to be. I will love everybody. The angrier they are, you watch. I will love, and I'm going to keep track of it in this little notebook that I carry. Love today, love that person. They didn't deserve it, but boy, did I love them. <laughs> we'll, we'll think that it's in us. It's, it's effort, but it's not effort. It's grace. Jesus has already put his holiness and his truth and his love right here. 
Put your hand on your chest. If you ask a five-year-old, where's Jesus live? That's what they'd say. The truth is that Jesus is in you. And the light is already shining. It's shining in the world. Now, sometimes we put it under a bushel. Sometimes we hide it in a closet. Sometimes we decide, I'm not going to love. Forget you. And the most amazing thing about God is he doesn't force us. He says, okay, you don't want to be holy? Have at it and live in the consequences. You don't want to be loving? Okay, you go do it. But ultimately what he says is, will you move to the light as I am in the light? Will you move out of the darkness upward? Will you start the process on the continuum? I think John is thinking of this text out of Isaiah. I I love this passage. It says, the sun will no more be your light by day, nor the brightness of the moon shine on you, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again. Your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light and your days of sorrow will end. Then all your people will be righteous and they will possess the land forever. They are the shoot I have planted, the work of my hands for the display of my splendor. What's God saying? The light's in you, you're the work of my hands, you're the shoot that I've planted, I've got something growing in you for the display of my splendor. You know, when when Clark Kent rips off his shirt and you see the S, something's about to change. What I really think is when I rip off all the junk that I cover God with and just let the light show, he makes opportunities and changes and something superhuman divine takes place. You see, the truth is that Jesus is up there in that light. He is the light. And and even more important, he's not only the target for our love and our truth and our holiness, but look at this. I know you guys are thinking, wow, this is like science and everything. He gives us the Holy Spirit, and it's drawing us, pulling us, pushing us toward the light. Um, when you dive, you wear a buoyancy compensator. It's a vest that inflates. Push a little button and it sh- fills, up, fills with compressed air and it starts to pull you upward. And when you're ascending, you sh- fill it enough that you can ascend at a, at a safe rate. And once you fill it, you're going up. You are going up. Unless you drain the air out, it's like wearing a life jacket, you are going up. My brothers and sisters, If you have accepted Jesus and the Holy Spirit is in you, you are going up. You can fight it. You can kick with your fins down as hard as you want. You can be stubborn and say, no, I'm not going to do it. But the truth is the Holy Spirit is pushing you, pulling you, drawing you toward holiness, toward truth, toward love. That's the goal. Then in the last two verses, John gives us a test, and he just... He wants to give us something to measure ourselves by, and this is what he says. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister is still in the darkness. You want to see how you're doing? That's pretty clear, isn't it? Anyone who loves their brother and sister and lives in the light, and there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or a sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. What he's saying is, are you moving upward in love and truth and holiness? Then you're in the light. You are already in the light. But if you can't do those things, if you don't want to do those things, if you're not going to try to do those things, be honest with yourself. You are swimming in to the dark. And the Lord wants to change that. The reality is that God wants to create more love in us. He wants to pull us up to know Jesus better. That's the core of this whole church, to be more like Jesus, to live the Christ-centered life together. That's what we're trying to do, and, and God is at work already in you. And, and you wonder, what does that look like? What does that look like? Well, I want to give you just a couple of quick tangible things that you can do if you want to increase. 
First one, confess that you are not where you're supposed to be and that I'm not where I'm supposed to be. We're not there. In wisdom and holiness and love. Not there yet, Lord. Sorry, I'm not there. Confess it. Second of all, ask the Lord to come and help you because he always answers that prayer. Lord, help us become more like you. Third, surrender. Those areas where you're holding on to and you don't want to give God, surrender. Just say, Lord, I lay it down. I don't get along with this person very well, Lord, but I'm going to lay it down. You show me how to love this person. Lord, this person hurt me deeply, and I don't know what to do with that. Lord, this situation wounded me deeply, and I'm still carrying that around. Lord, this situation is, is horrible, and I don't know how to be in a good place with it, but I surrender it to you. Show me. Come, fill me. Do something in the middle of this. And finally, begin to love more today. Today. Don't put it off. Start to love more today. So, so, so let me tell you why it's so important with a couple of quick illustrations. Uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, the great movie star, um, was raised by foster parents. She never really had a mom or dad, and she was raised through all sorts of very, very difficult homes. And a reporter in New York once asked her, uh, Miss Monroe, uh, was there ever a moment you felt loved? She thought for a second, and she said, one time when I was seven or eight, the woman that I was living with then was putting on her makeup, and I was watching her kind of at a distance in case she would get mad and hit me. But she was in a good mood that day, and she said, come here, honey. And she took her powder puff, and she powdered my cheeks. And for the first time, maybe the only time in my life, I felt loved. So simple. So deep. No wonder Marilyn Monroe gets into drugs and sex and, and suicide. There's a gap in her. Let me, let me give you another example. Um, uh, Greg Norman, a few years ago at the Masters, blows a six-shot lead. In the last round, he, he starts six strokes ahead and he loses. He gets second place to Nick Faldo. And it's crushing. No green jacket, no win. And he is despondent and... Uh, the interesting thing is that, that golf tradition says that afterwards the, the winner walks over to the loser and shakes their hand. So Cameron, stand up. So what happens is the, the winner walks over and is supposed to shake his hand. But you know what Nick Faldo does? He does this. And he holds him for too long. <laughs> he doesn't let him go. And he says... Greg, you are the most amazing golfer I've ever played with. And this has not been your day. But God loves you and I love you and you are coming back to this day. Everybody was freaked out. I mean, you know what they call Norman, the shark. He's not known for warmness, but you know, he later reported, it's the most loved I have ever felt in my life. Wow. A powder puff, a hug, changes things. One more quick story. A, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Sticky Grobnik. How can you forget that name? Sticky Grobnik. Uh, sold Christmas trees in Chicago and he mostly had really beautiful trees that were very expensive. He said one day a couple came to him and he said, I remember them. The guy had a super long nose and a great big Adam's apple. It was odd looking. And the woman that was hanging on his arm was spectacularly beautiful. And he said, it was so odd that I, I remember them. And he said, I, uh, I showed them trees and most of the trees were way too expensive. We walked past the, the real beautiful trees, the tall trees, the full trees, and and finally, at the very end, where I threw the trees that nobody would buy, this couple who were dressed in shabby clothes like they had bought them from Goodwill found a tree, and it was uh, almost barren. It was, this is the Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Branches on just one side. 
And they said, sir, how much is this? He said, a dollar. And they looked each other, at each other as if to see, is that, do we have that much money? And then he, they said, and what about this one over here? And there was another one similar to it, totally broken branches and branches off one side. And he said, I'll give them both to you for two bucks. They dug in their pocket and got their two dollars and they took these two Charlie Brown Christmas trees home. And uh, Sticky, by the way, do you want to really buy something from a guy named Sticky? <laughs> but uh, he said he was walking home and he walked past a little apartment and he saw the man go in. And uh, he looked in the window of that first floor apartment and he said what he was stunned at is how beautiful their Christmas tree was. And at first he felt bad, like they had gone and bought another tree or maybe they'd stolen it when I wasn't looking. That was one of the prettier trees. But you know what the truth is? They'd taken those two half trees and with hours of labor they had interwoven their branches. They'd wired and twined the two trunks together and then covered it with paper ornaments and tin foil and little lights. He said it was the most amazing tree I'd ever seen. My brothers and sisters, that's the truth of all of us. We are all missing a few branches. We're all a little needle bear. We're all lacking something. We're not there yet. But, but what God is trying to do is get us together. And through love, he wants to make us into something greater. They will know us by our love. As we hug each other, as we do powder puffs, as I give a good tip to the waitress who's been rude and just say, God bless you, have a great day. As I handle that guy who's not treating me very nicely with a smile and a, you know what, thanks. As I do the right thing, the loving thing, God begins to build an ornament in it, build a monument, build a Christmas tree where Christ is celebrated. That's us. It's time to start loving each other. Around you are people that look like they are all together. I promise you they are lacking a few branches. Look for places to love people. Ask God to show you and he will. It's time to love more. You want to grow deeper in your walk with God? Love more. A few years ago, I was in another town, and I, I needed to get a suit clean, and I took it into a cleaner that I'd noticed, and it was One Hour Cleaners. That was the name on the sign. And I took my suit in and said, I'll wait for it, or I'll come back in an hour. And she said, no, no, you can't have it till Thursday. <laughs> wait, wait, you're called One Hour Cleaners. Yeah, yeah, that's our name, but that's not what we do. <laughs> our name is Christian. Wouldn't you hate people to say that's your name, but that's not what you do? That's not who you are. I don't want to be that person, and I don't want you to be that person. Let us love one another as Jesus loved us. By this the world will know you are my disciples. Today. Let's pray. Move in us, Lord, that we would understand what a great offer you give us to make us into kind, sweet, loving, patient people. The implication is, Lord, that we can be different. We can grow. Come now, build love in our body. In Jesus' name.